Hi. Hello, everyone out there. How are you? Great, great. <laughs> great. Thank you for having us in a Friday morning. Actually, a very sunny Friday morning here in Lisbon. Uh, we, we can envy this. Uh, thanks, Ruth, uh, for your words and uh, for at uh, Câmara Municipal de Lisboa for the invitation, of course. And it's, it's really important for organizations like Gerador to have a space uh, to speak at uh, events like this one. So thank you uh, for this opportunity. My name is Tiago Siguraldo. I'm the president of Gerador. I will do the introduction, speaking about what is Gerador. And then Clara Mant will take over. She's the director of Academia Gerador, as Lutz said, our knowledge department. So if you allow me, I have this small presentation that I share with Clara. Clara, can you, can you put forward the presentation? Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Hello, good yeah. morning. So, uh, what is Gerador? <laughs> Can we, you, you will have to, yeah, thanks. What is Gerador? So, Gerador is a non-profit organization dedicated to journalism, culture, and education. It's simple as that, it's very simple. Uh, more than speaking about our mission, let me just talk uh, some of our projects in these three areas. So if you can uh, move forward, okay. First, uh, we have a magazine in a print and digital fo format, mainly focuses on cultural themes. Uh, and we try to talk about what's going on in the country with a clear attention to sustainability, youth and the population and activities in the interior of the country. We have a site as well. Um, here it is. Uh, you can find it in gerador.eu, where we publish news, opinions, research reports, and the calendar of cultural initiatives. We have usually half a million viewers per month which is a good number here in, in Portugal. Then we have, uh, we pay a lot of attention to social media because we know that younger generations get their news from these platforms. We try to create content dedicated to these networks and not only using the classical format forward of a publication from the site. Okay. There are a lot of activities in the cultural dimension that we create and produce, but don't worry, I'm only going to talk about two of them. One is, is this summit about the cultural and creative sectors. It's an annual meeting where we invite artists, cultural thinkers, head of companies, and even politicians to debate the future of these sectors. The last one in June last year, uh, was totally digital. The next will happen in May this year, and we're still figuring out if there's an option to do it physically, let's hope so. Um, but uh, it's, it's one of our main events in the, what we do. So next, we have Trampoline Gerador. Uh, Trampoline is a really big event, has about 10,000 visitors in only one day, between 3 p.m. and 3 a.m., we have a total of 60 cultural initiatives, ranging from music, theater, food, street art, performances, and much more. And we do it in everyday spaces, in the street, in a parking lot, in a restaurant, an old store, or even in an apartment, if we can persuade the owner, of course. And most of the times we do. And this is a free event for everyone. And finally, the last area of intervention, education. First, we have an academy with uh, 17 different courses and new workshops every month. Courses like creative management, executive production, cultural communication, design, photography, illustration, and so on and so forth. Um, then, 
I'm proud to, to announce that Gerador is part of an international consortium that was hired by the European Commission to evaluate the statistics of the cultural and creative sectors all over the European Union. There are a lot of data out there and we have the mission to find a way to present that data for everyone use and to create new statistics that are missing. For instance, everything about digital arts and other online activities. This is a very ambitious project that will take us two years to conclude. And then we have a project that, uh, that, is, very, that is very important to us, Subersal is a project that intends to really connect the creative and cultural sectors with the environment. I don't know how to say super salty in English. I guess it's like a scary bump in the way, something like that. But uh, okay, Gerador is not an organization focused on environment. We are a platform of journalism, culture, and education, as I told you before. So the first step that we took was to reach out to organization that deals with this every day. We made a partnership with Zero, probably the more well-known environmental organization here in Portugal. And uh, we start to debate how these two areas, culture and environment, can get together. So we decided to have two approaches. The first is to try to give tools to the cultural and creative communities to make this green transition. We already put forward the guides with best practices for artists and individuals, and another guide for organizations and cultural spaces like theater, cinemas, all kinds of venues. You can check this for free in our site, gerador.eu again. Um, it's important to underline that we are still learning. We are not an example, at least for now. But we choose to share this learning path with everyone to exemplify that anyone can do the same. It only takes the drive to do it. Internally, we are changing things as well, taking, taking small steps, but with commitment. For instance, the magazine that I told you before is made of recycled paper. We have eliminated all plastic bottles, cups, and everything uh, in our offices and in our space open to the public. And most importantly, everyone that works at Gerador, and we are 24 now, has this mindset and has the will to make this change. Tambra Municipal de Lisboa is one of the main partners of this project, and we are developing right now an online tool to help measure the carbon footprint of any cultural activity in partnership with Lisboa Innova, the Agency for Environment and Energy of Lisbon. And we have a roadmap with a lot of ideas and challenge ahead. The second approach reflects about the way that culture can inspire the entire population. Here, we are creating a big sensibilization campaign with advertising space on TV, radio, outdoor, with cultural personalities as protagonists, like actors, musicians, artists, people that everyone knows. We are hoping that these familiar faces can help to trigger the changes that we need as a society in a broader way. The last but not least, the reason that we are here today, but on to. So is but on through, um, so we do a lot of research, maybe but on through Gerador Key Metrics is the most important of our studies. It's a poll representative of the Portuguese population where we try to understand what Portuguese people think about culture. We do it every year, every year and it's the only study of this kind in Portugal. So we know that decision makers in cultural field, but in the political and business areas as well, look at these results. Clara will have a little more to say about Baronto, don't you, Clara? I think you're on mute, Clara. Yeah, you know, <laughs> let me just 
Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I don't know what's going on with my mouse cor cursor. I don't know how to call it. It's because this you're your co-host during this presentation. So you're seeing uh, a little bit. Yeah, but I couldn't reach the end mute, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yes, I do have a little bit more to say. Thanks, Tiago, for um, presenting Gerador. I will now talk about uh, the barometer uh, a little bit in detail. Um, just to give you an overview of what the study is, and then I will show some examples of the data that we have collected, more for you to, to get familiar with some of the conclusions that we came to, but also so you can understand what we can do and cannot do with this study. Um, so I really could use my mouse if it would show up, but okay. Um, so, the, the barometer is an annual robust study with more than 1,200 interviews, and it is representative of the Portuguese uh, population. It has a stratified sample, which means, uh, in, I suppose not all of you are familiar with statistics, so I'm sorry if I'll, I'll say something that is not um, very understandable, but feel free to ask all the questions. Uh, but it has a stratified sample, which means that, uh, for example, if 5% of the Portuguese population uh, live in Lisbon, then our study is going to have 5% of the people answering from Lisbon. And this is true for all the regions, for gender, and also for age ranges, so that we can take more precise conclusions, taking into account these variables um, for all the questions. Um, we, this is a study that happens, the, the big um, study happens once a year, but then we do shorter questionnaires throughout the year so we can track any changes. It's a, a kind of very adaptable uh, study, even though we want to keep some of the same questions from year to year so that we can compare the data. Uh, for example, last year in 2020, we had just entered the first lockdown when we were doing it. So we felt like it was impossible not to include questions about COVID-19. And so it has this um, flexibility for us to adapt to the reality we're experiencing, even if we want to keep some of the questions in order to be able to track uh, possible evolutions. It is different from other studies, such as the Eurobarometer, because it tends to focus more on the behavior and on the opinion of the people. So, for instance, while the, in the Eurobarometer, lots of the questions are from the economical perspective, which is also very important here. We, we also want to know that, but first of all, we want to know uh, people's perception and consumption of culture, regardless of the impact that it has on the economical uh, sector. For example, um, we don't need to know, or that is not the first question, is not if people have been to the cinema. We ask them if they have seen any movies. It doesn't matter where, it's just to understand if the content is reaching them. And uh, this is one of the ways in which we differ from more conventional studies. We, we as Tiago said, intended to make this study as a tool that can freely support authors, cultural agents, and political business leaders in decisions in a way to understand what people are looking for, what they know, what is yet unknown to them, what importance do they give to culture, how they see it, what role it has in their lives, what do they think culture is, what artists do they know, uh, what artists they don't know, and also what knowledge do they have of their own country, where have they been, what cultural places have they visited, does where they live influence how far they have been, how many capitals of district they have visited, and, and so we try to get this perception of, of the views that people have. So um, now I'm gonna explain a little bit about how the study was structured in 2020, which I, as I said, was very different from 2019 because of COVID. So the first um, section 
was to understand the relationship between people and COVID-19 because we thought that if we were going to evaluate the impacts that it had had on culture, we first had to understand how much it had impacted people's lives. So we, we wanted to understand, had they lost their jobs? Um, had they not? Are they working from home? Are they not? Um, are they scared of what's going to happen? And this was, or do they feel supported by, by the state? Um, and then uh, also what consequences of um, COVID-19 on culture were? And if, if for example, um, people stopped consuming as much culture, if they felt like the state was giving the necessary support to the cultural sector, and, and then we created some um, scenarios to understand people's disposition for um, future events in case that the population had been vaccinated or if the cases had uh, calmed down, if people were still available to go to certain events and to certain places so that we could help uh, cultural agents to start preparing for uh, a comeback. Then we added a section about journalism and information because we felt that it was um, a very important time for, for people to be assessing a lot of information and the credibility was a, a big um, question always, but especially during this time where it was so important to, for us all to be on top of the news and, and to have access to information. So we wanted to understand how much people value journalism and where do they consume it from. Uh, then we get a little bit more directly into culture and understanding what people uh, think that the role of culture is, what, what is this, its importance in society and where it is placed regarding other sectors such as environment, security, health. Um, and so this section allows us to have that perception. And then the cultural and individually, uh, individual, we explore how people feel or not represented uh, in the culture that they know if they wish to, to dedicate more time to culture or, or not, uh, and what do they expect, to, how do they expect to consume culture in the, in the following years? Uh, and also if they have any relationship, professional or uh, as a hobby to culture. Then finally, we have a section about economy where we look at what people think the role of uh, private organizations and brands is with, uh, within the cultural sector and whether they perceive some of the, um, of the brands that we ask about, uh, if they perceive them as uh, brands that invest in culture or not, and if they think they should invest more. And we also uh, looked at the purchases over the internet that people did throughout this period. Uh, then, on the cultural consumption, we sought to understand uh, how much people were consuming, if they were uh, looking at Portuguese authors and not just international authors, if they intend to consume more culture, why, why not? Because <laughs> that's also um, valid and the perception that they have of how much time they spend uh, with each medium and how did that change within the lockdown. Finally, we have this section about education, which is not really a section with specific questions. It is more um, an analysis section. Since we came to the conclusion in the first study 2019, and that was also reflected in this one, uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, the level of education really impacts how people consider culture, how do they relate to it, how they value it. So this is a section where we take this variable of the level of education and we see how it reflects uh, on the answers of the other questions. Then at last, we have the cultural references section, which is a more 
relaxed section, I would say, where we just ask people to indicate um, which artists they they admire more in the country, what who's their favorite actor or actress, who's their favorite director. Uh, we see we, what kind of names come up or not. Um, you can see that there is, uh, for example, uh, a, a top of favorite actors and actresses, which is more or less stable and it goes, it crosses all the generations. And then you can see some new names popping up and we think that is very interesting to see how people are actually getting to know um, new faces. But also you can see that there are some things that are not going as well. For example, in cinema, if I'm not mistaken, I think 70% of the people who answered couldn't name a director that they, a film director that they admired. So it is kind of a way to track um, the health of the, of the sector and of its relationship to, to the people who are part of it uh, with the people. Now we have um, an overview of the results of some of the main conclusions that we came to. And this is, these are the general results, but then uh, in the following section, I will zoom in a little bit on Lisbon so you can get to know um, some more in more detail what we found about Lisbon. Uh, let me just try to move. Yeah, no, no, my Zoom is really not cooperating. That's fine. Um, so, one of the main conclusions that we came to is that more than 70% of the Portuguese affirm that culture is at least regularly present in their lives. You can see here, we asked them which of these sentences best represents the role of culture. And um, do, I would wish I could read the options, but uh, okay, yes, okay. Uh, the two first ones indicate that people don't dedicate that much time to culture, while the two last ones indicate that either they do, but not as much as they would like, or culture is essential in their lives. So you can see that 50% of the people uh, in the general population consider that it is um, present in their lives, but not as much they, as they would like, and yet 18%, 19% consider it is essential. And this is basically common to all age groups. And uh, the, the answers that say that they don't have space for it at all are very, very low. Only 1% of the people saying that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. <laughs> And uh, the, as I was saying, the higher the education, the more culture is important in people's lives. And here you have an example of how the answers change according to uh, the level of school education or the monthly expenses. Uh, and therefore you, you can see that, um, you can see that 80% of the people who have a level of university education uh, consider that culture is either regularly present in their lives or essential for their lives. And then 36% uh, of the people that only have an initial level of education don't have as much uh, space for culture in their lives. And these differences are not as um, obvious in the monthly expenses. Um, young people between 15 and 19 are the ones who feel uh, that culture is less thought out for them. This is a question that we ask in, in order to understand if people feel like their generation is represented in the cultural scene. Uh, and you can see that 40% of the people aged between 15 and 19, 39.6% of the people feel like culture is not as directed towards them. And this, this is the generation where it happens more. You can see here in the difference between my generation and other generations. Um, and then uh, if in, it's just a curiosity, but actually the next age group doesn't feel as misrepresented. So it is really just the younger ones who have 
that feeling more. Um, we wanted to understand if, if people perceive uh, culture more related to education or to entertainment. And it is an overwhelming response that culture is closer to education rather than uh, entertainment with 70%. And it, funnily enough, that is uh, even more evident in Lisbon with 79%. Uh, and this goes accordingly to the rest of the data that we have gathered uh, regarding Lisbon, which makes sense because it is a capital. Um, and as you can see, it has also a higher number in the North Coast, but uh, everywhere else in the country, it is quite... Um, the education answer is quite lower than in Lisbon. Um, well, I, I think I, did, I forgot to mention, but this first questionnaire from 2020, it was done during uh, the first lockdown. That was April, May uh, 2020. And so we wanted to understand if people felt like they were consuming the same amount of culture through online devices or at home in any other ways, um, but also to, to see how that developed. And then when we did one of the shorter editions of the study in October, we already came across some uh, very relevant differences. So in around April, May, 50% uh, of the people still said that they were consuming more or less the same amount of culture. And there was even 17% of people who were consuming more. And this was, again, uh, slightly higher in Lisbon. But then in October, uh, and only 25% of the people were consuming less culture. But then in October, there was a dramatic decrease with 40% of the people saying that they were consuming less culture. Uh, there's still half of the population who says they are consuming more or less the same. But it is a big difference. And in Lisbon, you can see the numbers also dropped a lot. This may be related to just exhaustion of uh, home consumption of things <laughs> after all of the time working from home. Uh, and then uh, we wanted to see just as a curiosity if people were available to pay for cultural consumption online, uh, just so we could kind of get a feeling of, of what was to come. And then uh, we came to the conclusion that these numbers were still not very much relevant. There were 34% of the people that were available to pay to watch a movie, but that's probably related to the streaming platforms, which are already more uh, common. But um, besides that, the only number that, that we thought was interesting was 20% of the people were already available to pay for concerts over the internet and the average price that they indicated was 11 euros, which is not that far from how much a uh, regular concert would cost uh, in Lisbon. So not as different from the values of face-to-face -face events. Uh, we also wanted to see kind of help um, the, um, the organizers of cultural events to make decisions for the future, as I said by creating some uh, scenarios, which I will show uh, a bit farther ahead. But uh, one of the questions that we asked was, whose responsibility would it be if, if in a, uh, to stop the spread of the virus in an event with uh, more than 100 people once that is possible? So um, in April, May, most of the people thought, 80%, thought that the, the responsibility belonged to uh, each person who attends the event, but this was a multiple answer question. So 56% also thought that it was a responsibility of the organizer and 36% of the state. But in October, we saw an increase on the, on the responsibility that was attributed toward the organizers. So this means that uh, the cultural agents that organize events will have to have um, an active concern for safety measures in order to make people feel comfortable. Now, I'm going to show you a few slides that look a little bit in more detail to Lisbon, so you can get some inside information. Um, we asked 
uh, everyone if they felt that culture had a more or less uh, or the same role, uh, more or less important or the same role during the lockdown period. And 59.5% uh, of the people answered that they thought it had a more important role uh, during the lockdown, which is very interesting. Uh, and only 10% responded that it had uh, less importance. Again, this is slightly more evident in Lisbon. You can see it is exactly, it is the, the place with the higher uh, percentage when it comes to attributing more uh, importance to culture. But we wanted to know why, of course. Um, so we asked if, if they felt that uh, it was more important because of the need to, to be doing things, the need to obtain knowledge, they need to keep in contact with others or be distracted or to understand the circumstances. The top answers were, again, the ones that kind of relate culture to uh, education in a way. As you can see, uh, time to obtain, uh, the time to obtain more knowledge is the one with 80%. And then the need to understand the circumstances and finally to keeping in contact with others with 49%. And then the part that has to do more with entertainment came last with uh, uh, because I need things to do or because it helps me being distracted. Um, the answers here don't vary uh, significantly in Lisbon. It's just for um, uh, curiosity that we left the data there. Then um, this is the same question that I showed you before. Which, um, which represents more the connection of people, the space that people have for culture in their lives. But there is an interesting um, difference. These are the age groups and the gender for Lisbon specifically. And you can see that between age 25 and 34, uh, almost 40% of the people consider uh, culture to be essential in their lives, which, if I recall correctly, yes. Uh, in the previous slide where we saw this question, which had the, the age groups for the entire country, this age group 25 to 34 had only 23% of the people responding that culture was essential for their lives. So essentially in Lisbon, it doubles. Uh, and we thought that was an interesting curiosity. You can see also that if you look to the general data of Lisbon, I wish I could point out, but my mouse is just non-existent. Um, but you can see that the, the values are slightly higher in Lisbon in general um, than in the rest of the country, uh, with 20% of the people saying that culture is essential for their lives and 53 saying that it is uh, regularly present. Um, we wanted to know, in this we asked everyone, of course, if uh, they had engaged in any of these acti activities since the beginning of the lockdown, a film, a theater play, a book, a concert, a virtual tour. And during the first lockdown, Lisbon was consuming more cultural than national average. And film was popular across all age groups, and this was also true nationally and virtual virtual tours were the least uh, and uh, there there are slightly differences toward, uh, depending on the age group. This is one of the scenarios that we created in order to help cultural agents to make decisions. We asked uh, how people would feel going to these places, restaurants, cinema, heritage sites, etc if the population had been vaccinated. This was uh, asked in last, last year, April, May. So it may, the perception of people have, may have changed um, already a little bit. We're now working on the 2021 study where we will understand how this has changed since then, because this was really the early pandemic. So it's natural that has some changes in the data have occurred, but you can see that typically in a scale from one to 10, only seven is um, an answer that indicates that people are certain about their answers and they're comfortable. So the only places that 
had answers above seven are uh, cinemas, restaurants, heritage sites, and hotels. But you can see, of course, these are these are the ages for Lisbon. You can see, of course, that there's a much uh, higher predisposition to attend a music festival or concert in the younger generations than in the in the older ones. I think restaurants are the only ones that don't show that much of a variation, but that is because we are Portuguese and we value our food very much. So <laughs> that is always a top priority. And the rest, well, comes after. Uh, but yeah, you can see that the numbers for the restaurants are quite high and cinemas are also okay, heritage sites, hotels, and the rest is already below uh, seven and disco clubs will probably uh, have a slightly of a harder time coming back to, to normal and also music festivals. Finally, uh, I think this is the the last one. As Gerador, we have a pretty broad conception of what culture is and we feel like it includes a lot of things um, that are present in people's lives and not usually the, the only the most conventional ones. But we wanted to know what people consider culture to be, what it means to them. Um, so this is a list of, of things that we asked. Do, they do you think that this is culture, yes or no? And uh, heritage, literature, painting, and theater are at the top. And then there are some more controversial ones like video games at the bottom, social media, internet, and circus. There, there aren't uh, huge differences from the general average to, to Lisbon. I think only, for example, general average of the country considers 56% consider circus to be culture in Lisbon that is slightly lower with 50%. That's just an example of a difference, but uh, in the big picture, there aren't that many. And that is it. There are a lot more data, obviously, that we didn't have time to show. And also one thing that we do with this study is that we can make all kinds of different combinations. For example, the study that was published doesn't include Lisbon in this much detail. We sometimes compare the regions, but we uh, don't analyze them publicly um, as much. But uh, we can always make this kind of comparisons and analysis according to the needs of um, cultural agencies or decision makers. And that's it, I think. Um, can and let me stop me sharing my screen because I can't <laughs> move my mouse. I don't know. Maybe uh, Robert and Chiden can help us on that because I'm I can not, certainly uh, help you with that. Yes. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Clara, and then thank you, Tiago, for having this lovely work.